So we had a thing called a rapid response unit. So if, we, you know, if something does kick off, we can, we have always got the resources to go and capture it. Talk, talk to us about that, because I've got images of you all in like black head to toe helmets on. <laughs> Sirens. Getting ready, getting ready to go. Exactly, you know, <laughs> scaling down the side of buildings and kicking, you know, through doors and kind of like, you know, stun guns. And yeah, it's really, it's really, it is very cinematic and cool. No, it's a bunch of bunch of nerds in baseball caps running around with a heavy camera. Guys, but, um... let's go! <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to The Fast and the Curious with me, Betty Glover. And me, Formula One fan and enthusiast and sometimes presenter, Christian Hugill. Hello there. Christian, thank you so much for uh, coming dressed as the chair today. Yes, a new shirt and I'd forgotten. I'm still not used to the set, despite the fact we've been in a few weeks now. But I am sort of, I have come dressed as the chair, haven't I? Yeah, because you sink into the chair anyway as the episodes sort of go yeah, along. It's very but comfortable. Now, people aren't going to see you. Well, if you're not listening to us, if you're watching us, then you'll be able to see that. But if you are just listening to us, you know, like you used to have to do, you know, in the war, just listen to things, <laughs> then you can now watch us on YouTube. YouTube. Uh, yeah, and it is just going to be me and you that everyone is going to be watching or listening to today because team principal Greg James isn't with us today, but he has set us a little bit of a quest, mm. a little bit of a mission. Mm. Because the best thing about this podcast is that we talk to everybody from the world of F1, where it, whether it's the drivers, wherever it's the fans, anybody that works in Formula One, works within the teams. We had Ellie, a fan, on last week. We also had Laura Winter, who presents F1 TV. So we like to talk to people uh, from within the world of Formula One. Um, mm. And this episode is no exception because we are delving deep into the world of Drive to Survive, which we know so many people absolutely love. There's so many Formula One fans that have got to know the sport because of Drive to Survive. Um, so today we are going to be speaking to executive producer James Gay Reese, who I have wanted to speak to for a very long time. Yeah, you even put it in the WhatsApp group, didn't you? Yeah, I did. This is a big deal because this guy is like, you know, we've all talked about Drive to Survive so many times on this podcast. This is the boss. This is Mr. Drive to Survive. Like, this is the big boss. It's kind of a big deal. Are you looking forward to it? I am absolutely buzzing. I've got so many questions that I want to ask him. I want to pick his brains about so many different things, like how they capture the massive moments on and off the track, uh, just all of the stuff, like everything that goes on behind the scenes. Like, we obviously all saw the massive news about Hamilton going to Ferrari. Going to where? Ferrari. Lewis Hamilton's Lewis going to Ferrari? Hamilton. Lewis Hamilton's going to Ferrari? Yeah, but like, how do Netflix deal with that? Probably put it in Drive to Survive. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll find out how they're planning on yeah, well, bringing exactly that in. What we're going to do. Um, but you've just had your first weekend off oh, yeah. from racing. Are you okay? I am. I didn't mind the not being a race last weekend, but I am quite excited, though. I am excited that, you know, it's, it's back. Quite excited, actually. Let me just, just fill a minute. Well, oh. Christian is passing around. Um, I don't even know how to describe these. Like, they're not. It's not a party popper. It's a. <laughs> Hang on! Don't ruin it. <laughs> Sorry. Because so everybody in the studio, behind the wall, our sound guys, our camera guys, producer Jimmy, Everyone's who's got absolutely one. delighted. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it is one, two, three. <laughs> Race week. <Woo! laughs> I love this sound, by the way. Anyway, what are we expecting from Australia? Oh, Christian, get on with it. I can't, I can't be bothered with this. <laughs> we don't have the time. <laughs> I'm just excited that it's race week. I wanted to celebrate. Um, what are we expecting from Australia? So, um, well, last year it was carnage. That's one thing we should say. There was red flags. There was race restarts. It was possibly the most chaotic race of the season. Possibly. It was certainly dramatic. Um, in terms of what we can expect... An early morning, the race starts at 4 a.m. UK time. Now, we have a lot of people who listen to this podcast internationally. We're kind of a big deal. <laughs> and a lot of people in America who will say that we have to wake up at this sort of time to watch the races all the time, especially Fast and Curious um, sort of well, head of logistics, I'm going to call it. I don't know if that's our actual title, but it is for the purpose of this. <laughs> Casey, who's off of New Zealand. Casey used to have to get up at this time to watch races all the time when she lived in New Zealand. Casey, average race start time for you? About 4 a.m. So we get all grumpy as Brits because most of them start dead early. But actually, for some people in the States and in the US, they're always having to get up dead early. So yeah, we'll have an early start. 
But the Australian Grand Prix, Melbourne, Albert Park, I love that early start because it always used to historically be the first race of the season. And it was the most exciting thing in the world for me as a kid, as like 11 or 12 years of age, to set my alarm dead early and watch it. And as I got a bit older and my dad got slowly more grumpy, he <laughs> wouldn't get up with me. So I'd like creep up in the middle of the night because uh, the race started at four, and I would sit like this is be- this was before headphones were even invented. I'm that old. Like I'd sit in front of the telly, like dead close, to have the sound on quiet to not wake everyone else up. And it was the most exciting thing in the world. So I actually really like. I still wish it was the first race of the season, but it's still quite cool to get up in the middle of the night and watch Australia. Like Christmas Eve. Yeah, exactly. Creep down in my pajamas, sit in front of the race. So yeah, I, I like it. But uh, also Albert Park such a brilliant track a street circuit so it's narrow close walls possible to overtake the australians love formula one there's always an atmosphere it's number one on my race bucket list to go to oscar piastri must be absolutely buzzing as well big weekend for oscar so yeah i'm excited for it to be for it to be the Australian Grand Prix. It's a brilliant, brilliant race weekend. One of my favourite of the season. And I'm, I, um, purely as a fan, I want to go next year. Uh, th- this is my... It, I've always been saying it since I was a kid. That's the one I want to go to. I'll come with you. Yeah. So, the, well, genuinely, next year, like, I'm going to make this happen. G- Betty's looking at producer Jimmy. Producer Jimmy? Producer Jimmy wants to Are you going to gonna be sending us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that as an absolute <laughs> massive yes. So, <sighs> race three of the calendar is about to it's about to get going but first let's get into our massive interviews we know how big drive to survive is right yes you love drive to survive yeah i I love what it's done for the sport because it you know i (laughs) hilariously the other day someone i said something on a podcast that some moron on the internet disagreed with and therefore they they called me a drive to survive fan like that that was a negative thing it's like firstly mate i watched my first race in 1998 probably before you were born so so, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So off. <laughs> Secondly, I don't like that being used as an insult because what Drive to Survive has communicated in the most effective way is all the stories up and down the grid. Well, you know, this whole podcast in our first season, so much of it was about you falling in love with the sport and me showing it you and Greg. And what Drive to Survive has done better than anyone else before is show that there are stories up and down. The, the paddock that that Haas battling Williams for seventh place in the constructor championship is interesting. The Alpine versus McLaren is interesting, and it's shown the personalities of the drivers that we've tried to do on this podcast. So I, I don't see oh you're a drive to survive fan as a bad thing. Yes, I've watched F1 since 1999, and it has made the sport I love more accessible to people. So I love what it's done. <laughs> I completely agree with you. I hate it as an insult because it has allowed so many people to get access into the sport and learn to love it. And it's also encouraged a really diverse fan base, which not a lot of fans and not a lot of sports have. So I think that is really interesting. Millions of people watch it from all over the world. We see the boom mic left, right and centre. Obviously, Sophie Ogg, uh, head of communications at McLaren, has been on this podcast talking about how much of a nuisance it is. Um, So they get there. They get into those nooks and crannies. Well, well, credit to Netflix. It's only a nuisance when Lando Norris starts asking other drivers whether they can do certain things after injured wrists. That's... That's not James and his team's fault. That's Lando's fault. <laughs> no, James and his naughty. team are getting some absolute gold. And and James has been there from the very start. He is the executive producer of Drive to Survive. And this was our chat with him. <laughs> James, welcome to the Fast and the Curious. It's lovely to have you here. And lovely to have you here from New York, I understand, which is very exciting. Yeah, here working on a couple of other shows. Um so it's not all about drive to survive, uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. Flying visit only four days, but coming home tonight, which is nice. Oh, so you've got you've got a bit of jet lag. You've got a bit of a cold going on. You've told us, so you're sort of trying to trying to hang hang together, piece yourself together. I guess. It's all right. I'm going to go to the Russian bars later and have a steam. You know, kind of like calm down before I get on the plane, and then you know, go and sleep on the plane. It'll be fine. Yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> 
You'll be fine. Let's get into Drive to Survive. Let's talk about it. Obviously, you have got such a huge back catalogue of award-winning work from the Amy Winehouse documentary, a film with Banksy, uh, Oasis, Supersonic, which is one of my personal favourites. What made you want to, to, to do Drive to Survive? Because back in 2019, when it all started, you could have, you could have been covering anything. Yeah, well, I did make Senna. So that was like, you know, one of my, my initial forays into... Uh, uh, documentaries and obviously into the world of um, Formula One. I just met the Red Bull guys at a uh, CAA sport event in London, uh, whenever that was, years and years ago. And there was this desire, they wanted to do a documentary. I'd obviously made Senna, so it was the common ground there. And uh, it just morphed into trying to survive one way or another. So, yeah, right, it was real, right, right place at the right time. Were you an F1 fan before that, James? Obviously, with, you made Senna, but, but I'm interested to know whether you approached making documentaries about F1 from sort of the perspective as, as someone completely outside of the sport, or had you been watching it growing up and that sort of thing? No, I can't pretend that I was. I'm a big sports fan, but Formula 1 wasn't my, wasn't my passion in those days. But obviously, making Senna, I got into it. A little bit more, um, and then uh, and then one thing led to another. Like I said, so you know, it's good, you know, in a way because I am a fan now, obviously, because I'm immersed in the world. But I'm not like a mad petrol head, and in some ways, it's good because I see it. I see it as a punter, really. I see it as just somebody who's not a massive fan. He doesn't know everything about it, and therefore, we try to make a show that appeals to a broad audience as a result, as opposed to just appealing to the really hardcore. We were trying to break into you know contemporary sport in some shape or form. Didn't know I asked from my elbows at that point in time. And it just, yeah. like I said, we were really lucky. It just all came together. You know, we took it to Liberty Media. They said, listen, sounds good, but we're already talking to Netflix about doing the whole sport. You can jump on that if you want and make that because you guys did send it. You must know what you're talking about. We were like, we've got no idea what we're doing. And uh, <laughs> Fantastic honesty. Excellent. And then uh, we bluffed our way through it. Uh, and what a success it's been. It, it doesn't sound like there was any pushback, though, because, uh, James, uh, my role on this podcast is the, the resident F1 geek. Uh, I, I've been into the sport since I was old enough to know what it was. Yeah. And I've obviously been three times where the sport's not been that fashionable. I certainly remember at school, like I was the only person into it. So... Was it ever difficult to persuade other people that actually, no, we can make something of F1? It sounds like Netflix were pretty on board from the start. I think Netflix has seen an opportunity. And, you know, the guy, the main executive there who drove it, a guy called Matt Gruel, who's a very good friend of ours now. Um, I don't know what he thought he saw in it. I don't know, you know, because <laughs> he's a big football fan and you know, he's this and that. He obviously spotted, uh, you know, a sort of opportunity there. But yeah, it's a really good question. I don't know why he landed on F1. He could have chosen NBA. He could have chosen Premier League. Do you know what I mean? I've got no. He's not a petrol head, mm. so I don't know what it was. I mean, maybe it was just in one of those kind of like confluence of events that it landed. It all came together. And five years down the line, it has become such a big part of the sport. I'm fortunate enough to be in the paddock a fair bit, and it, and oh, Netflix here. It's just you're part of it now. Yeah. But, at the same time, that brings a sort of expectation, doesn't it? Because a, a, a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, we had Sophie Ogg, who is McLaren's head of communications, a big friend of ours on the podcast, amazing. And we were having a real laugh with her about lo, about uh, Lando asking Lance whether he can do a certain thing with his wrists when Lance had recovered from his injury. And Sophie was saying to us, I do keep telling them, when the Netflix booms there, behave yourself. Are they more wary of it now? And has that made it any more difficult now you're several years down the line? Sophie's great, isn't she? I love Sophie. She's, a, she's been good. Really oh, good we Sophie. love her. Yeah, yeah, she's cool. I think, um, I don't think they really give my monkeys. Honestly, I think it's slightly, as you say, we're part of the furniture now. We've got people on that show who've been there since day one, you know, that are still making it. You know, Rob Wills, our series director, started off as a junior producer on it. You know, so he's he's been in and around it for a really long time. And I think that, they do completely relate to it as a part of the sport almost. Now, it's really interesting, you know, it's, we always think, you know, it'd be really interesting. What would happen if the show got cancelled, which it will one day, because everything gets cancelled, it's cancelled at some point. I'm sure it'll be, it'll be absolutely fine, but it will be slightly different because it does go hand in glove now with the act, with the day-to-day -day runnings of the sport, you know. So, I don't know. But listen, no, the drivers are great. I mean... They don't want to do it all the time, you know. They've, you know, they're under pressure. They've got so many different, you know, commitments, and obviously they're trying to win races. But fundamentally, the buy-in's pretty good still. And um, you know, we've, I've just done a round with all the teams at the factories and in Bahrain, and 
They all want to be in it more, so it's a good sign. Go on then, James. Tell us who your favourite driver is. Who's the most impressive, do you think? I've got a soft spot for Leclerc. Oh, I'm yes. not saying he's the best driver, but I like. I think he's a great character. I think he's he's like an old-fashioned driving hero, Leclerc, isn't he? You could imagine him in a Ferrari in the 50s or 60s or something. Um, obviously, a big Lewis fan, <clears throat> working with Lewis on something at the moment. Um, I like Lando a lot, like Danny a lot. They're all, you know, listen... I think Alonso's a great character, a great driver. You're, you're naming the whole grid here, James. <laughs> yeah, I've been very diplomatic. <laughs> Talk to us about sort of how the storylines start emerging, because I guess you've got to be quite responsive to what is happening in front of you. Do you try and work out your own narrative sort of based on the footage that you've got? How, how do you even start, start that? It's a funny sport, listen, you guys probably know as much as I do. It's like... You can quite often sort of see what's coming down the road a little bit on Formula One. Mm. And obviously you don't get it right every single time. But you know, we sit in a room at the beginning of the year going, OK, what do we think is going to happen? Who's going to go where? What are the storylines going to be? Who's got a good car? Who's got a crap car? Because we can't film with every team at every race. So you've got to try and pick your battles. We also do sit down with every team at the beginning of the season and say, right, what's your race story going to be? What's your B story? What's your C story? And then, you know, try to place our bets a little bit. But then we're very nimble, so if something pops, then we just pivot to that. And, you know, the paddock's a small place. You can get around it pretty quickly. That's the good thing about it, you know, um, if you're there. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it is quite responsive. It's a bit predictive and a bit responsive, which is a bit of a crap answer to your question, but that's kind of the truth. It's not a crap answer at all. It's an excellent answer. And it's really interesting that you don't necessarily have crews in every single garage and can do a sort of quick response and go somewhere else if something happens. It's, it's really interesting. But... Do you have conversations when something happens? Like, for example, I, th I, I could have the exact dates wrong, but I think the F Lewis Hamilton to Ferrari news broke something like a week, two weeks before this season went on, uh, went on, on air on Netflix. And I know you guys must be editing fairly close to the release date. Did you have conversations about, well, do we try and get an element of that in this season? Does that shape the edit? Was there a sort of frantic WhatsApp communications on the day of how are we going to cover this for whether it be 2024 show or the 2025 show how do you deal with something like that when sort of it all hits the fan it's too late you know we couldn't do anything about that because you know you did we deliver the show to netflix they need a couple of months to get it ready for international so you know you've got to reversion it for 150 different countries mm. and it always goes down to the wire so no that you know we'd handed over the show it was all fully post-produced and everything by that point in time so you know it's the trains at the station it's not much you can do, do about it you can tweak like the odd line in something we had to do something for ferrari actually we had to tweak a line because it was a mistake. And we managed to do that once it was with the with the platform. But a major storyline like that, you can't re-edit it or anything like that. Because I mean, it just depends when it comes in the timeline. You know, just our cutoff is basically like really the middle of January. Like you might not have been filming anything that day because it's the off season. And then you get the situation where Ollie Behrman comes in at Ferrari or something like that. When these things happen and it's like last minute, how flexible can you guys be whether it's in the lewis situation um go and talk to someone go and get reaction from someone or whether it's with the ollie bearman situation actually we'd planned on spending this weekend with all this team but actually we're going to spin all that off completely how rigid is it and how flexible is it i'm guessing a balance between the two it is a bit of a balance we have a thing called a rapid response unit so if we you know, if something does kick off we can we have always got the resources to go and Accurate. Talk talk to us about that because I've got images of you all in like black head to toe helmets on, <laughs> Sirens. getting ready, getting ready to go. Exactly, you know, <laughs> scaling down the side of buildings and kicking, you know, through doors and kind of like you know, stun guns and yeah, it's really, it's really, it is very cinematic and cool. No, it's a bunch of bunch of nerds in baseball caps running around with a heavy camera. But, um, Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's relatively fluid, and obviously, it's partly as, as a result of. Having been in and around it for such a long time, we know, you know, they all know everybody. It's a short conversation. And but sometimes they tell us to do one. It's not always a yes, do you know what I mean? So it's, it depends on the situation. Uh, we don't get access to everything by any stretch of the imagination. Have you ever had a moment that has just really, really shocked you, that you just weren't expecting? You've just been in that right place at the right time and it's just you've stumbled across that moment of just TV gold? Yeah, they normally involve Romain Grosjean in some sort of shape or form. I mean... <laughs> He's a lovely guy, actually, but, you know, when, you know, he, when he, he had a meltdown, I think it was in season one or season two, and, you know, it was pretty, pretty raw, you know, to hear that from him when he was having a sort of crisis of confidence, then obviously his crash, and that was pretty insane, because he just thought the worst, you know, for a little bit, you were just like, you know, this isn't going to end well, 
And um, obviously Gunter was a great friend of the show, so it's Gunter's team. You're like, my God, this is, how do we deal with this? If it does go bad, how do we cope with it? So um, it was, uh, yeah, those moments are tricky, but you know, you need those moments of real authenticity when you, you know, real raw emotion because it is an emotional sport and, you know, it's an incredibly hard thing to do. So yeah. being on the inside of that is great because it's, you know, you really relate to it, I think. And that was what the show's done. It's just opened up the humanity of the, ser- of the sport to a wider audience because before it was just a bunch of people in helmets. You never really got to know, you know, sort of. Well, you've just mentioned Gunter, one of my favourite things about the season just gone, which, by the way, James, I actually think was probably my favourite season of Drive to Survive. I, I genuinely really? do. I, I, because of the Max dominance, loved the way that we focused on the different bits, like the Alpine episodes, etc. So I've really enjoyed it. But also, oh, great. you mentioned Gunter and, and the effort. I, I won't ruin the... Oh, well, people know, don't they forget it. I was gonna, the way that the last episode says, and, and Gunter... He didn't have his contract renewed. And it was like, oh, no, even though I knew this, it was like, poor Gunter. Yeah. And it got me thinking, oh, hang on a minute. Gunter involved in Drive to Survive, but off the leash without actually being a team principal could be a lot of fun. I'm sure you don't want to r- reveal your secrets on this podcast, but is it possible we've not seen the last of Gunter on Drive to Survive? Because I certainly hope not. You know what? We're still, you know, obviously, the, you know, we're having fun with that thought. Nothing, nothing's been sort of finalised mm-hmm. or agreed. But listen, as we know, he's a fairly free-spirited, loose, loose-lipped man. So, you know, he's a, he'd be an asset to any show in any form. So, watch his face. Um, look, James, we've got some questions in from our listeners, OK? So we're going to put some of them to you. Uh, the first one is from Erica. She says... When are the drivers and team principals actually interviewed? Is it at various points during the season or in just one sort of full recap conversation at the end of the year? It's no, no. It's like beginning, during and middle. Or beginning, during and end. So, you know, it depends how many, you know, not everybody gets does the same, but, you know, the bigger characters will do three, four, five interviews. Uh, William asks, I'd love to know how much are F1 or the sports governing body, the FIA, involved in the edit or sign-off of the series, do you get to make the version of the show that you and the team want to? That's from William. Well, Netflix have Final Cut, as they do on all their shows. So, <coughs> Formula One, aren't that involved in this? It's something really, really tasty, and it's like, it's a bit political, but it really rarely happens. They're pretty hands-off, actually. Let's get on with it. So, no, it's, it's really between us and Netflix, and then obviously the teams have a right to review certain elements of the show, but it's not creative control. It's like more about IP and stuff like that. Mm, interesting. Uh, Carla says, who comes up with the names for the episodes? Because they are always so dramatic. That's it. Between us and, um, and uh, Netflix every year, we have fun trying to work out what to call those stupid things. So it's, yeah, it goes. <laughs> <laughs> We've probably gone round full circle. Though. We're probably going back to ones we use on series one. <laughs> I would just do that. Just repeat. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that it will come to an end eventually and please we don't want it to yet I genuinely really don't but uh five years in are you looking at how the show carries on because i know it's not going anywhere anytime soon but yeah how much do you look at when when it's a successful show how do you find the balance between doing what's been popular and what people know but also particularly in an era where as we're saying max is winning a lot also keeping it fresh as years go on what sort of next for the show do you think we are we're looking at it we're looking at evolving it this year we've obviously started filming this season now and uh, we've brought in some new uh, senior executives to kind of like who've never worked on it before to kind of just breathe new life into it and just you know not that there's anything wrong with the show but you know it's healthy on any of these shows to kind of think what could we do differently and sometimes you you know you rarely throw the baby out of the bathwater you might make some you know relatively you know um, subtle adjustments to it We'll try to tell the stories in a slightly different way this year, which will be dependent on maybe deeper access in certain situations. But, you know, you're always going to have these radically exciting ideas and then you basically have to work with what you've got. We still love making it, though. I have to say, everybody still really enjoys it and we're really excited to rethink it a little bit this year and try to make it fresh for the audience at the end of the day, you know, because, listen, they've been so loyal and they still turn up in their droves. So they deserve, um, it deserve, you know, it warrants us to put as much effort into it as we can to make it the best possible show. Yeah, on that point, um, I guess that you've just got this such a good relationship with the audience from all over the world. Do you feel like a bit of a responsibility to sort of really tell that off the track story, particularly with this season and sort of everything that is going on off the track? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's a lot going on at the moment, isn't there? So it's, um, we are looking at that from a number of different angles. Um, and so, 
Yeah, you do. You know, we want to we want to entertain, but we do also want to give an audience an insight into what it's really like. And you know, we have dealt with really political issues in the past, and we probably will do again. Just about getting that balance right, because you know, a you know, you've got to be. Sometimes you have to be relatively responsible about you know what you're hearing, and you know, we've got a you know we've got an editorial and narrative responsibility to be balanced about things. So you just got to try and thread the needle, and you know. Tell an interesting story, but be responsible at the same time and entertain. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We really nice to see you guys. It. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Fascinating to chat to the executive producer of Drive to Survive and Box to Box Films, James Gay Reese. I am fascinated by that man. I love how they put that together. I loved that. Yes, I I am obsessed and I've wanted to talk to him for ages, like I said. So, yeah. Buzzing, we've ticked that off. Now, before we get into a listener question, Christian, you've mm. got a new little feature, mm. God help us, that you want to bring to the podcast. Um, can you just explain what it is? So it's called Off the Beaten F1 Track. Pardon? <laughs> Off the Beaten F1 Track. <laughs> I like that. that Did good. I do that well? Yeah, I really liked that delivery. That was really <laughs> so nice. what is this? That was lovely. <laughs> well, yeah, we wanted to delve into all areas of the sport. F1's been around for decades. It goes all over the world into different continents. And some of the stories you hear about happen away from the circuit as well. And I've got a prime example to kick us off that also might just test the skills of producer Jimmy and our, our new studio team here. Firstly, I just wondered if I could have a bit of change lighting. I just wonder if that would be possible. Oh, People at the back. God. We're yeah. not a mastermind. Oh, Ooh, maybe I am. I like that. We've gone blue for an air of mystery. Okay, that's lovely. I also would like just a little bit of music, please. Good. Excellent. Okay, this is, it feels mysterious, doesn't it? It feels like I'm on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Are you going to get on with it, Chris? Who wants to be a millionaire? Uh, <laughs> that was so good. Thank you. Food a friend. Um, now, let me take you back in time, Betty. Picture the scene. It is April 1995. You're in nappies. I'm in short trousers. Greg has just started at BBC Radio 1. <laughs> I'm still obsessed with Formula 1. And it's the weekend of the San Marino Grand Prix in Italy. What we now know as Imola. Austrian driver Gerhard Berger, a legend of the sport, is about to take part in a race for Ferrari. A race where he'll eventually finish third. Damon Hill won it. Jean Alesi was second. Jean Alesi, who, by the way, I have a um, Model F1 car. Can you just get on with No, it, sure, Christian. sure, sure. But <laughs> back at his home in London, two of Gerhard's personal Ferraris were stolen. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, that was a dramatic effect, though. That was good, wasn't it? They'd been missing ever since. Until... Now. <laughs> right now. Right now. <laughs> right now. The Metropolitan Police, that's the police off of London, have found one of the cars. Now, I'm not very good at road cars. So let me check. This is a red F512M, a fine specification of vehicle worth 350,000 of the king's english pounds an awful lot of money 28 years after it went missing wow 28 and what about the other one i don't know about the other one. Oh, no that's on, okay they found one. no that's that yeah. is impressive where was it what happened yeah where did they find it okay, we'll get there okay. officers so they're working with ferrari and international car dealerships around the world in what they've called a painstaking investigation. They realised it had been shipped to Japan after it was nicked. Then Ferrari alerted the force in January after it carried out checks on the model, which was bought, to answer your question, by a buyer in the US. So they found it. Don't know about the other one. That's still missing. So if you've seen it, at Fast Curious Pod on Instagram, I don't know if there's anything for us in it, but there's got to be something, you know, like some reward if they can help. Someone so must have missing. seen it. Someone must have seen it. They're quite big. Can't miss are, it. It's hard to lose a Ferrari, hard isn't it? Hard to lose a Ferrari. Hard to lose a Ferrari. I mean, you've really, really messed up if you've lost two Ferraris. Isn't that amazing? They found it. 
But so, the person that bought this car, yeah. do they get their money back? What, what happens? I don't know. I mean, wow. I've read it on the BBC News app. I don't know the finer details, but I, I just thought it was interesting. So I, I can't answer every question. Right, okay. So is this a thing for the rest of the season then? Off the beaten F1 track? Yeah. I would like to do more... Um, Investigative journalism. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, <laughs> maybe I could do a panorama or something. Hello, BBC, if you're listening. But... Um, Maybe, you know, some of the, the more left field F1 stories. I'd like that, yeah. All right, well, you do some digging then. Maybe we could get Gerhard Berger on. Well, that'd be good. I bet he'd do it. Producer Jimmy, Gerhard Berger would probably come on. We might, that'd be great. Well, Let's get Gerhard Jimmy, Berger Jimmy, add on. that to your little notes. I'd love to know. Add Jimmy's that to your notes. Lovely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Did, good did, thinking, Christian. Thanks. Before we carry on this episode, Christian, we need to talk about something that is so unbelievably up your street that I can't believe you're not head to toe in their merch. That's what this podcast is, isn't it? Talking about something way up my street, Formula One. And I do have Formula One merch, lots of it. No, it's no. well documented. They're my caps on that shelf in this studio. I'm not talking about Formula One here. Oh. I'm talking about something that is going to change your life and our listeners' lives. Right. NordVPN. Have you ever heard of it? I've heard of it. A fine company. I'm aware of their work. Do they have collectible hats that I could display? Well, I don't know about that, but I do know that they will change your life because wherever you are in the world, you can stay across everything related to Formula One. So talk to me about which Grand Prix you're going to this season. Uh, Miami, Vegas, Singapore, Canada, Abu Dhabi. They're all the planned ones. And now we've saved you because with NordVPN, you can change your virtual location. So even if you're in Australia, Miami or Singapore, you can still log in and keep up to date with all of our pals like Crofty and Karun Chandok and never miss a thing. But if that's not enough, Nord's threat protection technology shields your devices from viruses, malicious malware and phishing sites. So, look, you're protected. But when I'm away, I use my iPod, my iPhone. Your iPod, like 2009, yeah. yeah. my iPad, my iMac. Every, all the eyes, they all get used. So can I use it across different devices? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Because a single Nord login can be used across six devices. Woo! So I don't know if you've got six there. Maybe ditch the iPod. Fine. Like I said, I think this really is a game changer for anybody who follows Formula One around the world. And to get your best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash TFATC. Our link will also give you four extra months on the two-year plan. And there's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the description of this episode. I'm sure they haven't got any merch that I could have. And maybe, maybe some socks? I want socks. I want a cap. Okay, we'll get a cap. Message them. All right. I don't know. I can message them from anywhere in the world with NordVPN. <laughs> Didn't you say we've got a listener question? We do have a listener question. This one comes in from Susie, who says, what does it mean when you hear a track referred to as rear limited or front limited? Uh, I'm glad Greg isn't here because this is all about tyres. Oh. And Greg's a massive F1 fan, but we do sometimes lose him on tyres. Tire degradation. He doesn't like us talking about tyres, so I'll keep it quick. He finds tyre chat boring, but this is all about tracks that limit and wear either the front tyres or the rear tyres. So circuits where it's tricky to bring the front tyres in are often called front limited. It limits the lifespans of the front tyres. So that's circuits like Saudi Arabia, Miami, Barcelona, Silverstone, basically circuits with long and fast corners. If you think about a long, fast sweeping corner, that's going to put pressure on the front tyres as it sweeps through. So it's challenging on the front tyres. If it's rear limiting, it's often um, circuits that have a lot of slower corners that limits and wears the rear tyres. So it's basically pressure on the front, pressure on the rears, whether a particular circuit is front limiting or rear limiting is pressure on one of those two tyres. Nicely done, mate. Susie, I hope that helps you out. <laughs> it's a tricky one, that is. That's a, It's a really good question. And it's these things that people just sometimes presume you know. People like me just presume people know and say it. So we love our brilliant listeners for picking us up on those things. When we say things that people... I was like, well, what's that mean? So anything like that, whenever you're watching your Grand Prix this year, you just need to drop us a message We're on all the social medias, Fast Curious Pod. Just drop us a message. Or now you can put a comment under the, under us on the YouTube channel as well, and we will answer any of these little random questions throughout the season as we help you to uh, get to grips. It's a tire question with Formula One. Oh, God. Well, we're going to end it on that note, but we will be back after the Australian Grand Prix. 
get in touch with us, like Christian said. Any questions, any thoughts, any feelings, let us know. You getting up? Getting up. For the Grand Prix? Oh, I thought you meant right now. No. Um, <laughs> no I'm off. <laughs> um, no, I'm not. Why is that, please? Because it's my friend's 30th. So you don't fancy doing a night out for your friend's 30th then getting up at 4am to watch the Grand Prix? I just don't. I'm not going to lie to everyone and say that I am. As much as I'd like to, I'm not going to. But this is Jimmy, you get up? Is that a yes? No, 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 it's not. I bet, bet Casey, as we mentioned earlier, off of New Zealand. Casey? Yeah, Casey's getting okay, up. Casey is up and ready. Greg, at Greg won't. He gets up early for a living. He won't be getting up for the week. So it'll just be me and Casey representing Team Fast and Curious and getting up live to watch it. Yeah, but it. I am going to watch it. Oh, well, no, we're all going to watch afterwards. it. It's just whether you watch it live is always a chat for the Australian Grand Prix. And by the way, can I just say before we go, right, Formula One fans, if you are not getting up to watch the Grand Prix, that is your choice. And as we've just said with Betty, <laughs> oh, no. we respect that choice. I know where he's going. And we, with we it. touched upon this last season. If you find out the result of the race, for example, by looking on social media or listening to a news and sport bulletin on the radio, that is your fault. Don't try and because I used to work reading the news on the radio and people are texting going oh I can't believe you gave away the result of the race yes it's a news bulletin that's what it's there to do if you've forgotten to turn your subscriptions off on the podcast that you listen to and the podcast says Australian Grand Prix Review you need to take responsibility for your own actions F1 fans remember that this weekend okay it really gets me that F1 fans expect the world to stop because they've not watched the race yeah I, I do think just don't go on social media don't go on social media until you've watched the race don't listen to the news because you will get a spoiler. Turn notifications off on your phone. You need to take responsibility for your own actions, F1 fans. This is the only thing. I'm with you, F1 community. I love you all to pieces. Even the ones that give me stick on social media. I love you all. But this is the thing that gripes me. So come on, guys. If you're not getting up to watch the race, you have to deal with the consequences of that. Okay? Yeah, and do give Christian stick about the fact that he's matched the chair today. You said you liked this shirt before we started recording. It looks great. It just does look a bit chair-like, doesn't you, it? You have just morphed into the chair with white yeah. shoes on. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. We'll be back after Australian Grand Prix. See you soon. <laughs> I just don't understand why your shoes are. <laughs> have you ever worn them out before? No. They're Fox Fresh. They're Fox Fresh. Wow.